Good afternoon, um, everybody, and, and then welcome. Well, sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, um, welcome to our series of seminars at the Griffith Institute for Truth. Uh, today we have um, Terry Hobson, who is not a stranger from Australia. I need to read a little bit because you've done so many things in so many different places. I might get confused, but I'll start saying that Terry uh, did his uh, BA in the UK, where yep. he's uh, from, and you moved to America. Yep. Uh, where you did your masters, that's right, and then you came to this beautiful part of the world called Australia that's right. to do your PhD, and you were here for several years. We met at Southern Cross University. Seventeen, seventeen years. We were colleagues at Southern Cross. Yeah, University. and I believe you've done uh, Hong Kong Poly. Yes, before that. Yeah, before oh, I yeah. Hong, Hong Kong Poly, and so you've been Hong Kong and uh, Australia and so forth. He's the uh, founder, I can say this, and previous director of the Ice. Yep. Is that like a lab drop that you're running? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, you can explain my academic career. You can explain <laughs> the, the ice later on. Did they but... come on before actually ice was invented? No. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anything happened. Anything happened. And that's that. Just, uh... And uh, Perry is also the former editor, and he's currently the emeritus editor of the Journal of Vocation Marketing, that's which right. is an A journal according to the ABDC yep. list, uh, which is fantastic. He also when he left Australia, he, he went to Malaysia. He had senior leadership roles both at Taylor University and Sunway University. And he is now the director of the academy. Am I doing correctly this so far? Director of the academy of tourism at Breda University. You've done very well. Science. So I should be going back later. But you I should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, I visited Breda some years ago, and it was a beautiful, beautiful um, university with great campuses and great facilities, yeah. so I'm sure it's going to be from here onward. So thank you for being with us. Well, no, thank you very much for the invitation. It, 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 it's wonderful to be back, and uh, Sam and I have known each other for a very long time from the work I was doing here at Griffith. And, I said uh, I work for you as a PhD student. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. And, and Perry, just so you know, I don't know what you heard about uh, uh, video conferences and the internet. Mm -hmm. we also wow. Have, we also, we are we're quite advanced here. God. We also <laughs> have uh, a few uh, participants yep. that are online. So we'll try to monitor the online space. But are you happy for people to interrupt Absolutely. you? Absolutely. I, I feel like so, Putin. I've got such a big table and everyone's at the far end. So yes, a uh, weird situation. I think we see me. I hope you can see me. You can change that. <laughs> I don't know if you can zoom in a little bit. I think that might be a little bit better. Yeah. But that's a bit crazy. It's, uh, wow. There we go. Oh, someone's good at this. Oh, that's better. That's a little bit better. Fantastic. Well, look, th thanks for that warm welcome, Guy. And, uh, it's, and Sarah, it's particularly uh, wonderful to be back. He was so many friends I've, I've had here. And it's been great to be able to catch up with Anna today. And, and to, so Lady Hannah did uh, her degree at Southern Cross, which is a degree I set up. I'm going to actually, that's going to be one of my opening slides of that presentation as well. Um, so yes, I've had a bit of a long uh, history and it's nice to be with so many international students uh, as well. And um, so apart from my day job, which is at Radar University, I also work with a couple of other institutions. So I don't know if you've got anyone from Vietnam, but I also work with um, uh, sort of Thang University in Vietnam as well, and I've been on, on their board for a long time. It's got a University of Ostrava in, in uh, the Czech Republic. So it's great to be back. Uh, it's been a year and a half since I've been back in Australia. We were able to get in um, after COVID, which is quite challenging because I was marooned in Kuala Lumpur for quite a long time. So and my two daughters were here studying at uh, ANU and the University of Newcastle. So it was great to actually get back to see them. So I've been gone for a year and a half, so it was a great opportunity to come back, and, and thank you very much for the invitation to come back here and uh, see you all. That's uh, wonderful, so thank you so much. And um, as I said, uh, my, I'll go back one slide. What I thought I would talk about and maybe share, really just sharing, is you know what I see from my sort of part of the world, which is the challenges on where tourism is going. And, I should preface this presentation by saying it comes from one um, which I was working on with a colleague called Ian Yeoman. So some of you will, may know Ian Yeoman. Ian was at Victoria University in New Zealand for a long time. Victoria He's University of Wellington. Wellington. Sorry, <laughs> sorry, I'm that right. You're right. Before they get upset, 
And uh, he recently returned to the Netherlands, where he'd been also a uh, long time at uh, Sony's Extended University. And about three months ago, we were asked to give a presentation on the future of tourism. And um, Ian does a lot of scenario planning, and he was looking at 2050 and beyond. And so they asked me to look at sort of between now and 2050. So that's sort of where you know, some of the thoughts sort of come from with that. So I'm not looking beyond that. Often I do that, but for, the, for this for this purposes. And one of the things that's happening, I see, is that tourism is in a very interesting state of transition as both technology and also this transition, which I'll talk about a bit more, is, is, is coming up. And in particular, in terms of what we're seeing with environmental issues and, and climate change and sustainability. And that's bringing together a lot of tension. And I'm going to talk about that tension because I've got that happening right now where I am on my other side of the world. And it's quite interesting coming back to Australia. And I was reading in the media the other day that Sydney Airport was celebrating the fact they've had more airlines now flying into Sydney Airport than they've ever had in 103 years. And they're very excited about this. And I'm living in a country now that's trying to stop people flying. And we'll come back to that and the tensions that's happening in Europe and you know the different things we're seeing around the world. So on this trip, I um, stayed uh, briefly in the United States. I was in Phoenix, Arizona, which has had its hottest rate of days of above 45 degrees centigrade. <laughs> so I was quite pleased to get on the plane and come here, it was a bit cooler. But anyway, Sometimes people ask me, what am I most proud about when he's talking about all those things? And probably the most proud I've ever been with this particular day was when I was at Southern Cross University as a head of school, and I was asked on stage in Perth. And that year we were competing for the Australian Tourism Award, and we won the award that year. So that's with my colleague Nika Witzel, who's uh, from the Netherlands, and she's still at Southern Cross, and the then Minister for Tourism, a guy called Joe Hockey, who later became... Uh, treasurer and Australia's um, ambassador to the United States. The paragraph I'll point out, which you know, you'll, you'll notice was here, was for me when I was asked why this award was so important. For me, it was the things we were starting to do, and I'm going back 20 years, remember that. So we launched a degree in environmental tourism management and another one in indigenous tourism management. And I saw those were really important things at the time. Now, sad to say, neither of them continued. <laughs> and we were just talking about, and I was just talking about that before you come in the room. And as I reflect back on, sometimes you get ahead of yourself in the world. You can see something that's happening. You realize that change needs to happen, but the rest of the world may not have caught up with you yet. And this is often a challenge for education, I think. Sometimes, should we be leaders or should we be followers? And often part of the discussion is, oh, we, we're here to provide people for industry, you know, we need to follow and be up with what industry is doing now. And sometimes I think the question in our lives is, do we need to be ahead of what's happening? And that's really where we should be. And that brings up some tensions as well. So that's kind of the, the uh, things I've been thinking about. And as we think about where tourism is going, um, Ian was talking a lot about very deep trends relating to demographics, to economics. And you can see that bursting out of the world now as you're beginning to see, for example, China wrestling with even releasing its census data because it's showing that the China population of China is declining and the impact economically that will have. So those are longer term trends. They are out there, but they are going to take time to come through. So we're already seeing the impacts in countries like Japan, which has declined its population by over 20 million. You see already countries like Germany, which were very clean to throw their doors open to the Syrian population because it boosted a population which is not growing. So we, we see some longer term trends, but I'm not going to get into those today. I think the, the more ones that I think our world is going to struggle with in the next 10, 15, 15 odd years are these other couple of areas, which is the sustainable practices and the technology. And I think those are the two things that I just like to focus on. So now we all remember COVID. We're all pleased it's gone away. Most of us have, uh, 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 I think, hurriedly forgotten COVID. And I think, sadly, for some people, um, a lot of things we should have learned from COVID have been pushed away. So my own university, particularly as soon as COVID finished, everyone wanted to come back to teaching face-to-face. -to -face. 
which I think was a shame because I think a lot of the things I was doing, working with people online around the world was actually way ahead of what we were doing before COVID. And sadly, I think a lot of those things have been forgotten. So I think there's some, some things to say about that. But as you remember, before 2019, everyone was talking about over-tourism. That, that was the word. In fact, I think the Oxford Dictionary used the word over-tourism was the word of the year for 2018. So we went from over-tourism to no tourism. <laughs> Suddenly there was no one anywhere. And you can see just how dramatic that fall was. And it doesn't matter where you were, people like myself were locked out of our home countries. Uh, you had absolutely no movement in various parts of the world whatsoever. And the impact of that was significant. And what I think some people have forgotten was how the impact was more significant in some places than others. And that comes true in the data later, because in some countries, governments printed money, and in other places, they did not. So in countries where money was printed and handed out, people had a lot of cash. And I think the one statistic that blew my mind was when I read that the average Australian at the end of COVID had $40,000 in their bank account. Now, before COVID, the discussion in Australia had been how much in debt people were. So well-off countries, and I think that, that will see through. So as soon as people could travel again, we saw this huge pent-up demand which was really significant. But you know what we also saw was people were, were ready to, to continue to work from home. And as, if leisure tourism is the flip side of people working, this changed that dynamic quite dramatically. Because often we've seen people fit their travel around their work. And now that dynamic has changed quite a bit as people are able to take their work with them. And that's going to change the tourism side of things. But the flip side of this, of course, was that many people lost their jobs during the tourism, during the COVID. The tourism industry was the first industry lost their, people lost their jobs. And this has had huge impacts coming through. And um, I think that's something we've got to think about. And I'll talk more about that in a moment. But when you look at what's happened with travel, Booking.com is a Dutch company. Um, they've been now bought out, but their headquarters is in the Netherlands. And you can see there after the, the impact COVID had on them but how fast that now has come back. And so on the back of this, I went for a little visit short recently to the headquarters of TUI. So TUI is based in, the, uh, uh, in, in Germany, but they have 50,000 employees, just to sort of put the company size in. So this is me meeting the CEO. And uh, when I caught up with him, I said, how's business? And he looked at me and he said, well, business is pretty good. I said, January is our busiest month. I said, great. Uh, how many bookings you do? He said, three million. Three million. The population in the Netherlands is 17.5 million people. So if you take out the people who are in prison, in hospital, too old or can't travel, let's say you have 15 million people. That means, you know, one, you know, when you start looking at this, one in five people have been booking holidays. So the, the number of people with one who's a small company, with the biggest tour of so the demand has come back dramatically. But the second bit of the thing for me interesting was the conversation. The first was, I said, what are you looking for as you look to the future? And he says, I'm concerned about the sustainability of my business. He said, I don't think my customers can get up with it. And he said, I think that's my biggest challenge. He said, I'm concerned as, as a, for us as a business as we go forward about how we have to change. And that was reinforced because we actually had a, some students working on a project for Tui, and the project they were working on was what customers mean by sustainability. So they have 149 shops in the Netherlands, Tui do, and most Dutch, older Dutch, still like to go and book it physically. They go to the actual travel agent, so on. The students started working on the project, <clears throat> and the interesting thing was, it wasn't the customers that couldn't understand what they meant by sustainability. The biggest problem Tui had was that their own staff didn't understand what it was. So in fact, the student project which we had with the company moved from being understanding customers to actually staff training <laughs> what their staff meant by sustainability and what it meant for the company. So that was their first issue. The second one I thought was, uh, or Stanley was saying this, so it's, the second was they said they can't get employees to come back to work. Now I'm gonna pick up on that point later. Because when I arrived, you can see there's a very big lobby of, of the company. 
And um, I looked around and I said, um, I said, I don't want me saying, I don't see many staff here. And he looked at me and he said, Perry, he said, I'm trying. And I want to underline the word trying. He said, I'm trying to get my staff to come back to work two days a week. And he said, it, even that is a struggle. And so the realities of how business is, is being booking. So back to the point here about the, the, the challenge of employees. So many people lost their jobs, but then even when tourism came back, and this is some data from the US, people actually resigned from our industry. So this data from the US shows leisure and hospitality was the number one sector people said, I quit, I'm out of here. And I was flying back from um, the APAC pre-conference and I stopped over in Dubai and I stayed a little uh, Ibis uh, Aqua Hotel. They couldn't work out how to check me in at three o'clock in the morning. I came down for breakfast. They couldn't work out how to either give me a breakfast roll or make me a coffee. So I must have been going red. And finally, the manager came over and he said, sir, what's the matter? I said, look, you couldn't check me in. You can't do breakfast. I said, what's going on here? And he looked at me and said, um, said why are you asking? I said, well, I'm very frustrated. I'm in education. And he said, look, I can't find people who want to work in hospitality. He said, before COVID, I had staff at this level. He said, if I can get them at this level, I'm doing well. And he said, the problem is I've got no one to train. <laughs> They've all gone. So the industry has faced this huge challenge. And, you know, for a lot of economies, if we look around many countries of the world, not all, but many, we've got very full employment. Now, this is quite challenging in some places, not so challenging in others, but in Europe at the moment, you cannot find employees. Germany, the Netherlands, France, UK, they are struggling to open up business. And having been in the US now, and in the US it's quite interesting because they are now trying to push the wage rates onto customers. So just ordering a coffee at a Starbucks, I was asked whether, you know, you're automatically asked how much you want to tip. And the tipping starts at 20%. So I was asked to sign 20, 25, or 30 percent. So you can see what's happening. They've got to find a way to increase wages, but they don't want to increase prices. So within all that, within the Netherlands, this was the chaos that ensued. So as travel came back, not only did people want to travel, but there was no employees to deal with it. So there was three to four hour wait times. Now I'm somewhere in that photograph down the back. <laughs> It was horrendous. And so these are the challenges that came through. And as we look to the short and long term future of tourism, these are the sort of challenges we've got. So when you look at the data from companies like Skyscanner, what they said, you know, 41% of customers said they're planning to set the same number of holidays in 23 as they did uh, last year. One in three want to do even more. Only 7% said they were going to travel less. So you can still see this big surge, you know, for, for travel is there. But it's not everywhere, of course, because in Asia, particularly because China was quite restrained for another year in opening up. And as I mentioned earlier, many developed countries have printed money. So I'm, I'm, on, I'm on the board of, a, of, a, of an organization here in Australia. We made the most money we could ever make financially. COVID was fantastic for us because our staff were paid for by the Australian government. <laughs> Whereas when I was recently in Asia, I was in Vietnam, I was in Thailand, you know, I'm talking to people who've gone through all their savings and have gone into debt because the country didn't print money. Mm -hmm. So it's a, you know, a lot of people forget this. And so when we start looking at what's happened with tourism, you can see cashed up people have hit the, the airways very, very hard. Whereas countries, particularly in Asia and other poor developing countries around the world, the story is completely different. And that's something people mustn't sort of forget about, the, the, you know, what has happened in this bit of the story. But that will also give us some indication, I think, about where things are likely to sort of go next. Now, this leads into the challenges that we're seeing. So I was at a conference, at the Asia Pacific Travel Association Conference in Chiang Mai. And this is a presentation by the Tourism Authority of Thailand. And this is about their strategic move. So uh, this is the Director General there speaking. And uh, he said his first strategic move was his strategy was as simple as ABCD. You can see that in the presentation. <laughs> and, he's, 
And he said, A is airline. So he said, our first strategy is to get the airline capacity back. Now, the major problem is that Thai Airways went bankrupt. I counted 40 planes on the tarmac parked at Savannah Poop Airport. So the, as the airlines come out, but that means Thailand is a, you know, needs that air capacity to grow. And so this is quite interesting because when you go from A, B, C, D, the second part of that strategy was ESG. <laughs> now, I thought this was very clever because, you know, as he, as he made the point, if you want to communicate your strategy to people in the tourism industry, keep it simple. And he certainly took that lesson to heart. But what was interesting for me was what the E stood for. And the interesting contradiction here, of course, is that E stood for environmental ecosystem and sustainability. So you can see the tension that's coming out here. We want tourism back. You want to build up aviation. You want to build up, get the numbers back, tourism back, employ people in a country that was hit very hard by COVID. And yet this is going to have environmental impact. But that's going to be tough. And this is therefore, I think, the tension that's happening. Because now let me take you to the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is a very small country. Uh, if we put Australia around Europe, you can sort of see the space that it would encounter. And if you put the Netherlands around Brisbane, it would just about <laughs> get up the sort of northern part of the suburbs of, uh, of, of Brisbane. So um, I live in the south in Breda, which is not the, the, the little bit that hangs down the bottom is Maastricht, but I'm along the, the bottom line there. So I live seven kilometres from the, from the Belgian border. Now, as I said, it's a small country, but interestingly, with some quite large tourism problems. So earlier this year, we launched a new tourism campaign in the Netherlands. This campaign is called Day Away. <laughs> so this campaign was launched in March with the key goal of getting people to stay away. In particular, bachelor parties from the UK were the main target uh, of the campaign. But this spoke to a larger problem that was existing, that as They've had over tourism before COVID, COVID had gone, it's come back. You're dealing with about 20 million visitors coming in and now the country's going, we can't cope. So how are we going to deal with this? And this is a story that's been rolled out in Barcelona, in Venice, in Dubrovnik. So around Europe, this is now rolling out. So that's one bit of the story. But of course, if you go to the newspapers this morning, which I'll talk about in a moment, you'll see another bit of the story coming out. But so this campaign, uh, these, are, these are some shots from the campaign. If you like to go online, you can you can see it. Um, the second thing that rolled out was last week, we decided to ban cruise ships from Amsterdam because there was too much pollution that has been caused. So the government, uh, the Dutch government in Amsterdam, has decided that we don't need these cruise ships, and so that's been uh, they all be taken out. And again, I've highlighted a few key points there because. This has to do with, again, cutting down the number of tourists and dealing with pollution. So these are the two critical trends and issues that are coming out again and again in different places. The third one, which is more to do here with gear as well, is what's happening at the airport. So the current plan at the airport is to shut down 60,000 flights out of the airport. So Amsterdam Airport gets about half a million flights a year. Uh, and the plan is to take 60,000 of those out. And this is now in, in the court and there's a huge legal wrangling over this. But this again is part of the global story that's happening. And again, I like to bring this closer to home because you have to remember that Schiphol Airport owns, I think it's a 35%, 30, 35% holding ownership of Brisbane Airport. Plus they also have a 35% ownership of Hobart Airport. And it was quite interesting because I went in to meet the uh, CEO of Eindhoven Airport uh, in earlier this year, in about February, March. And um, so we got chatting and I asked him where he'd spent his Christmas. And he said, well, he said, you know, I, I, was, I went to this little town in Australia that I love so much. And so I went down there. So I said, where's that? He said, oh, Byron Bay. So he said, oh, I said, that's great. He said, where did you live in Australia? I said, well, funny enough, Byron Bay. So um, he was being the CEO of manager. So I really met, uh, he was there for six years, managing Brisbane Airport, and he's now managing Eindhoven Airport. So it's mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, Roll, roll, roll. Yeah, that's right. 
So Roel is um, very passionate about the fact he's coming back down to Australia. I think uh, I think he's back down this month or next month for, for a meeting at Hobart Airport. And again, the Dutch have uh, you know got invested as a company, but behind the company, you've got to remember, Schiphol Airport has got the Dutch government behind it. So therein lies this sort of challenge. So this was again the issue of noise, and Brisbane Airport, as you know, is also being felt with the noise issue because it's a 24 hour airport, but they've allowed more and more building closer to the airport. So again, this is going to be another story that's rolling out. Another bit of the story then was last year I was heading off to the United States. I was a bit worried where I'd leave because they announced they would close the airport down. So we have a group uh, called Stay Grounded, which has consistently been blocking up the airport, particularly going after small private aircraft. And as you can see in the bottom right hand uh, slide, we have not only got Extinction Rebellion, which has become globally well known, but we also have now Scientist Rebellion. So several of my colleagues at the university are members of Scientist Rebellion. And so this brings up an interesting challenge about how we develop tourism and where so many of my colleagues do believe that we should not be traveling the way we are. So this brings, as I said, the tensions quite closely together. Now the presentation I was asked to give, the challenge was of course, is I get this, and this is what's happening in the Netherlands, but you look around the world, we're talking 60,000 flights. Now, 60,000 flights sounds like a lot, but when you realize there's 423 airports under construction around the world, 60,000 flights is a bit of a drop in the bucket. And when you look at the countries which are developing this at the moment, so India has got the largest number of airports under construction at the moment. So they've got something like 200 on airports, 150 to 200 airports under construction. A country which had a very developed railway system beforehand. That was one of the legacies of British colonialism was given the railways. But now they're going very, very hard on aviation. Mm -hmm. But if you want to look at what's happening, then you discover that Indigo is uh, got before when I made this presentation three or four months ago, had a 500 planes on order. Most people have never heard of Indigo. The reason I talk about Indigo is because the, they have a Dutch CEO, so Peter Elbers was the head of KLM. KLM has about 160 planes. At the moment, Indigo has got 300 in the air. It's got 500 on order at that time. Qantas, by contrast, has got about 186 planes. Now, Peter Elbers, in, and in India, you've also got Air India, which has just been taken over by Tata, and they, had, at the time, had made the largest order ever from Boeing for 470 new planes. This is just one country. So this was in March. Uh, so at that time, India had more than 1,100 planes in order. Last month, they had the Farnborough Air Show in the UK, and Indigo decided to order another 500 planes. <laughs> just to give you the scale. So this is three times the size of the fleet of Qantas. Mm. Just one hour. So when people ask me, what's the future of tourism? Now, wh why does this come meaningful to me? Well, Peter Elvers was not only the CEO of, uh, um, of uh, KLM, but his daughter is in the second year of our tourism degree program. <laughs> now, that begs the question, and I, my guess, question to you, anyone today, is how many planes do you think there are on order around the world at the moment? Do you all want to have a guess? During COVID, they parked 18,000 planes. The world fleet of planes, I think, is about 36,000 or something. Just to give you some rough sort of numbers. You want to have much of a guess? 30,000. 30,000? No, not quite the entire replacement. Planes take a long time to, to be produced. So, the, you know, most will, will, will come out. So, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000, 10,000? 3,000? Current rate at the moment, at the moment, uh, there's about 12,000 planes on order. That was before the latest Farnborough show. So it would be up to about 15,000 now. So that's about uh, just under a half of what's flying at the moment. Now, some of those replacements are new fuel efficient planes, which is great. But that just sort of gives you some idea. And so the growth is continuing. And, and even places that you'd think are not particularly highly visited by tourists, 
For example, in China, Xinjiang province is going to build eight new airports. So you can begin to see if you when people ask about what the future of tourism is going to look like. When you look at what's in the pipeline, this begins to tell you what the future will look like. Because where the investments have been made, whether it's in airport construction or the planes, this already begins to tell you how the future is going to play out. Like we've invaded an aviation cluster to the institute. Yeah. <laughs> and so aviation is, is, is a huge. Now, in Europe, the, the argument has been we should move away from aviation. So one of my, my, my colleagues, Paul Peters, who um, very pleasingly got the David Airy Award at the University of Surrey a few weeks ago for his research. His research is very much about aviation and carbon. And the challenge that we're going to be faced about that, and his main target has been very short flights and interestingly, very long haul flights. So the problem is also Qantas saying we're going to fly to New York. That is actually a big problem because the amount of energy it takes to get that plane off the ground with all that fuel. So Europe has become very focused on trains, which would work in that context, but here in Australia, kind of good luck if you want to take long distance trains. Um, that's really been the challenge. So if you look around Europe, this is the global mega project that help, hopefully will get people away onto trains and away from short haul flights. However, the tension, as I've highlighted in red there, is that there's too little investment and a lack of political will. So if you're in Germany, you've got a system, but once you need to go through Germany from a Dutch train onto a Czech train, which I did recently, good luck to you. <laughs> the whole system is creaking. So despite the fact there's a lot of desire to that, it's very difficult to find other ways to move people around. So most people are a bit shocked when you look at Europe in terms of high speed trains. Would anyone like to guess which country in Europe would have the most kilometers of high speed railway tracks, so over 200 kilometers? Would you like to have a guess? France. France? Yeah, a lot of people think France, even Germany gets a bit mentioned. Interestingly, it's actually Spain has the most, three and a half thousand kilometers. Uh, the Netherlands has an exciting 90 kilometers of high speed track. Now, I mention this because when you look around the world, it's often interesting to look somewhere else to see what's going on. If we look at China over the last 15 years, they built 40,000 kilometers of high speed track. <laughs> Which begs the question, why has India decided that aeroplanes would be such a good way to go, given they had a lot of railways and the Chinese have now built themselves a lot of railways. In fact, this year alone, China will do 3,000 kilometers of new railway lines which would be equivalent to what Spain's got. So this gives you some, again, indication that what we seem to be doing is, is in many countries where we do find rail, it's to connect up the, the, the long haul with, with, with flight. So even if you look at Thailand, Thailand is putting a new rail system in, but it's basically to connect three airports, <laughs> which have been redeveloped. So Savannah Plume will be uh, doubled, uh, it's about 120 million. The old Dong Wan, which they closed at one point, which is now the world's largest low cost carrier airport, about 50 million. And then use the power, which is down by the tail. So you begin to see again when we talk about the future and just what's happening when we see investments. Because when you look at investments, and these are the world's biggest mega projects, the world, so there are three of them on railways, admittedly. But you can see it's very disjointed. There's one in the Gulf. There's one over in California that it's putting on with. Um, the Gulf Railway one was, was actually put on hold for a bit. So you can begin to see that transport in terms of world mega projects is certainly there. But when we ask ourselves again, what's the future going to look like? If you're not building it now, and having just been in Brisbane yesterday where they're getting very excited about a cross-river project, <laughs> which seems to be running well behind time, building railways is a very difficult long-term project. And, and that's part of the challenge. Okay, let's, let's look at a bit more of the, the industry. Let's turn to cruising for a moment. Now, if, if people thought planes were bad enough, try cruising. That's got another problem. Um, everyone loved the movie The Titanic, of course. Everyone, everyone seen the movie The Titanic? So, yes, yeah, so, well, it's all very good, isn't it? Now, let's look at what the Titanic looks like compared to a modern cruise ship. I was watching the show on the Titanic on SBS last night, and they were talking about how big the ship was and stuff compared to a modern cruise ship. 
it will be a tiddler. So this year alone, about 90 new cruise ships will hit the water. And just to give you some perspective of size, this is like an icon of the seas that will hit. Uh, that's about 7,500 passengers on that ship. So the cruise industry, again, when you want to understand the future of tourism, you're going to look at investment, look at where the money's gone in, because once you've built a cruise ship, you've got it 20 to 30 years, just like airplanes. Mm -hmm. So again, when we look back, cruising has come very rapidly out of um, COVID, and you can see some predictions there. Um, and so the industry is heavily indebted because of COVID, but is obviously moving very fast uh, again. And if you're not sailing the ships, you're building the ships. So Germans have, for example, a huge shipbuilding industry along with uh, Finland, etc. This is the world's largest ever built cruise ship, which was built for 9,000 passengers. It was originally built by Genting, which is a Malaysian company based out of Hong Kong. They went bankrupt. So Disney has bought the ship. And it was designed for 9,000 passengers. Crew is on top of that, about another 3,000. So this is the scale of kind of what's happening. So when you start looking around at that, so whatever we look at, you can see that travel has come back in a hurry. Uh, so short term, that's going to happen. As we move longer term, you can begin to see where the capacity and investment is going in. So in the terms of the European context, you can see that tourism is reckoned to be will be 20 to 30 percent bigger than tourism was before COVID. That's that's the sort of prediction. Mm -hmm. So today I didn't want to talk about long-term trends, as I mentioned. I can talk about silver tourists, we can talk about other long-term things, but I think it's interesting to look at some of the trends. And a couple of comparisons I think are often important. So in Europe, there's a lot of talk about leisure travel, the mixture of, again, this issue of people, business and leisure working together, and I'll, I'll touch on that later. The whole technology, automation, mobile bookings. Sustainability, very interesting for me on this particular chart only came at the number six. Now, when I was looking around, uh, sometimes I get bored, so I look around all sorts of interesting things, but I picked up the top trends out of India. And what I found interesting there was sustainability was number one in India. So sometimes places that make a lot of noise about things often don't necessarily follow through. And I think that's an interesting part of this. And Sometimes, you know, you question things like sustainability in India, really? And then I noticed this other one, which was actually showing that Indians are more concerned about sustainability for clothing than any other country. And then I go to myself, really? And I've got a lot of Indian friends and I was saying, really? And one of them pointed out to me, he said, Perry, you do realize what's in the middle of the Indian flag? You want to know what's in the middle of the Indian flag? And no Indians in there. It's a spinning wheel. And that was part of when they went for independence. Gandhi pointed out that they'd lost their industry to Britain because they lost the ability to make their own clothes. So sustainability for clothes is a very major factor in the Indian context. And so sometimes when we look around the world, we, have to, we tend to think that the Germans are the most sustainable. In Europe, everyone talks about Germany. But in fact, when you start looking around, the data starts to tell us another interesting story. So when we think about where we're going, what's the future direction? Now, obviously, you only have to pick up the paper today, and it's all about climate change. So whether it's roads, looking at the evacuation of tourists, we had the same issues on the south coast of New South Wales not long ago. Uh, we will see this again and again. And the question often in many people's minds is, how did we get here? And here are a couple of the obvious suspects. And one of the challenges I think we'll face in tourism is that airplanes, cruise ships, are very obvious targets. We're only about two to three percent of carbon emissions, yet we are very visible. So at my university, we're now talking about introducing a climate change course for all students, making that mandatory. The challenge is we have a games academy, for example, and working on the VR stuff and so forth today has been interesting, but our games academy, you know, what do you point to? There are seven massive data centers in the Netherlands that use huge amounts of energy. People forget that Bitcoin last year apparently used the same amount of energy as all of Kazakhstan to create something that no one knows even exists. So we managed to use a lot of energy and you have to look at that. But tourism, of course, we are very visible. 
And so this, I think, is part of the challenge. And the question is, how close are we to this cliff edge? And you don't have to go far. And the tension that this transition is bringing us, because for any industry to transition, and the question is, how will the tourism industry transition? And at the moment, what we've begun to see with Greta, et cetera, has been this question about shame on you. So you've got flight shaving, as it's called in Sweden. And we're now seeing a lot of people say, I will not travel by uh, air. I've got a lot of commitments. We have some universities I'm dealing with in Europe who said, we will only have exchange partners that our students can get to by train, no more flying. So the, this, these issues are becoming much more. And then on the other side, we're seeing much more action in public with stop oil, with last generation in Germany, uh, as I said, with Extinction Rebellion and Science Rebellion. And so these are pushing the boundaries. And we've seen it in Sydney, where there were some significant prison sentences given out for people who blocked up the Harbour Bridge. So the tensions are beginning to come out. They're coming out in public. They're only coming out in some countries, but the question is going to be, when will that roll out? Now, if we go back to the OECD, which is the group of rich countries, they basically looked at two things that they said will impact tourism trends going forward, digital transformation and sustainable tourism policy. So those are the two issues that I think will be critical. If you go to the World Economic Forum, again, two issues they've come up with. On the left-hand side, aviation and all the impacts that will have. And on the right-hand side, all the stuff about digitalization. So if we dive into that a little bit more, when we look at climate change with that, so people tell you they're concerned about sustainability. Every survey I see says people are oh, very worried about sustainability. But my fear is most people don't understand what they mean by it. And what was quite interesting, even if you look at this survey, which was done by, I think, um, this was one by, again, I think by statistical, they asked people what aspect of sustainable travel is most important. Issues such as supporting local businesses, 30%, staff are being paid well. They come out top over, you know, say sustainable transportation, which only came out at 20%. So what people regard as that is the interesting issue. Because obviously this is not going to go away. And I think the tourism industry is kidding itself. And for me, it was quite interesting meeting with TUI and to realize their significance. They can see this for their business is a very major risk factor for sustainability of their business. No sustainable planet. So you can begin to see this shift is happening. I often ask when I give some lectures to students, I ask, I, I give them this little quote, it's a bit of a long one. And I ask them, when do you think this was written? And as you may have picked up on the media, the reports about tourism and sustainability have been around for a long time. This was a book I picked up in 1991. So it's not like people didn't know about it. We had the Sustainable Tourism CRC here, which was founded in 1999. And yet the data keeps showing us. The planet's getting warmer. The oceans are getting warmer. We've got more carbon in the atmosphere. If you want to look at this over 8,000 years of his, human history, we can see, you can see how fast it's changed. We can look around and see that as rising sea levels, the impact that's going to have. I was speaking, I was asked to speak in terms of fan where I go off and go in, in Vietnam. And the challenge for me was that no one was even talking about it. And yet I pointed out the fourth most at risk city is Ho Chi Minh. So the greater Bay Area where you're from in Macau, that's, you're going to get a bit wet there as well. <laughs> so, I mean, for Vietnam, these are the predictions of what southern Vietnam will look like. Now, in the Netherlands, our, our international airport, Schiphol, is already six metres below sea level. Six metres below. So if you're looking at you know, the Dutch coastline has been protected and fortified over years. But many countries cannot deal with that amount of coastline. It's just going to be impossible. And with temperatures rising, you can see, interestingly, Ljubljana, which is in a valley in Europe there, I mean, eight degrees centigrade increase is significant. So many of these cities will change, and this means tourism patterns will change. There was an interesting article the other day about how the UK is looking forward to becoming a summer sun destination. Because who's going to go to the Mediterranean if this changes? So, you know, when we look at the UN climate change reports, 
you know, they're, they're saying that some really key things are going to have to happen. Here. And so the question is going to be how, again, our challenge is we're only two to three percent of the problem, but we're a very visible two to three percent of the problem. And I think that's where we're going to have to not only own up to our bit of the problem, but how we're going to deal with this. And so there are some good news, and I don't, I don't, sometimes I, I, I fear I always depress people or we depress people too much. So there are good news that they, you can do things with greenhouse gases. So I don't want to, you know, ignore that there's not stuff that can be done, because I do believe that in the investment that's been done, where we look at where renewables are taking over, things can happen. So I think we have to keep on that. And we shouldn't forget, I remember when I, before I moved to Australia, one of the big fears of moving to Australia was that we had the ozone layer and we were all going to get fried. But luckily, we've closed the ozone gap. We acted, change happened, the problem's gone away. So I think for all of us in tourism, this will be part of the challenge. Was, well, how will we deal with that? Will we be able to get to net zero? Will our industry be able to deal with that? And I think that's going to be the issue that we've got to deal with. So that change is coming. And you can see different governments. So the Swedish government is now charging airlines more money if you bring in older planes. Now, if you look at the age of the Qantas fleet, this would be very expensive for them to fly to Sweden. <laughs> so these are sorts of issues that we are having to look at as you start looking around. Now, of course, as I keep mentioning, tourism is a small part of the problem. So if you look here, this is from The Economist. Air travel, you can see, is a little thing in the white there. That's only reckoned to be, uh, uh, what's it, uh, 0.85. If you look at various other foods, whether it's beef, whether it's rice, you know, there are other significant ways we can change this. And I guess eventually it will come down to what choices are we going to make. But whether it's hospitality or tourism, all of this will, will, will get impacted. And it will see changes. We're already seeing changes. We're already seeing an increase in, in, in people changing their diets, but it's still not having the impact that is going to be needed. And so I think we have to, to face up to the problem, look in the mirror and say, what's it going to mean? Will we be able to make cruise ships more sustainable? They're probably some of the most polluting at the moment. The companies are coming out with sustainability plans, but note the word aspirations. So even when we start looking at what's going on, a lot of it is not really going to deal with the significance of the problem. Which means for the industry, as we, we change things, how will even, and I've only talked about aviation today, but let's face it, even the hotel industry will have to have significant, significant investment. So again, when they've looked at it, they reckon that, for example, um, the accommodation industry to get to net zero, it will be costing the, the industry millions and not billions rather to deal with this issue. And so the retrofitting, and particularly when you think about it in, in very heavily tourism dependent countries like Thailand, Vietnam, et cetera, it's gonna be really significant. The work here is showing that it's gonna cost 4,700 euros, which is what, 6,000 Australian dollars per room to make those changes. Now that is massive amount of investment that will be required. So as we go forward in this, I guess, you know, everyone wants to, to be renewable. Where will that investment, where will that sustainability come from? And, and who's going to invest in that? Now, the flip side of the solution to the problem will also be the technology. And I think the technology side is where we've got some hope. So we've started taking on so much new technology. The question is going to be, how will that change come and will it come rapidly? Now, most of you in the room, particularly PhD students, will not know what that thing is on the left-hand side. Now, when I was growing up, I used to use that. I took my daughter to London not long ago when she was, uh, this was probably about eight, nine years ago, and we were walking around London, and she looked at me and she said, Dad, what's that red thing? I said, it's a phone box. I said, oh, really? What's it for? I said, well, you go there to make a phone call. So, oh, she was holding a mobile phone in her hand. She goes, but why would I go there to make the call? I don't understand. And I had to explain to her that this was before mobile phones were invented. And she looked at me and she said, and you use this? Yes. You are so old. <laughs> and you know, the speed of that change of technology. And so when I think again, and, and, and listen today with Bill and, and with Anna looking at VR, 
which I've written about 20 or 30 years ago, to see how that has evolved as other industries have moved. Because now today's youth doesn't know an age when we never had technology. We have connected up people around the world with that technology. And we can see what we've got at the moment. My question is what will come next and how will that impact us with tourism? So what will our mobile phones do? Will they be 3D? Will they be a hologram? Where will that take us? Because that will be, I think, the next stage. So part of our sustainability will come from being able to use more and better technology. The question is going to be, how will that be digitally connected and interconnected with us? And if we now connect that with chat GPT. So again, you saw my slide there about how fast we're taking things on. Would anyone like to guess how long it took chat GPT to get to 100 million customers? You know how many long it took them? Not long. It took them two months. It took Netflix 18 years. <laughs> it took Facebook, what, 4.5, 4.5 years. So the uptake of new technology. So if we can get a technology in that uptake. Next question is, who uses ChatGPT? Which countries do you think are the biggest users of ChatGPT? You want to have a guess? Interestingly, America, number one. Anyone want to guess number two and number three? India, India very good. India's number two. <laughs> Interestingly, a country from South America. Brazil. No, Colombia comes in at number four. Followed by the Philippines. So three out of the countries are in Asia. Now, they account for a third of all the downloads of ChatGPT. Now, interesting when we asked the hospitality tourism industry, are you using it? What was interesting was only 8% of the accommodation, this was some work done by booking.com, only 8% of the industry was using it. But you can begin to see how fast this will start to move. So for booking patterns, holiday suggestions, take a holiday, come up with my itinerary, make the booking. This will change again substantially. So again, we are on the cusp of yet another revolution, I think, in what's going to happen with technology. So COVID has laid the foundation for this because most businesses said that they moved faster in, in 18 months of COVID than they would have done in five years before. So we've all got used to using those apps. When I go through Schiphol Airport, what do I see? We've got no staff, but we've got technology. So these are the shops now. What do you notice is missing? There's no staff. These are the bookshops at Schiphol Airport. That all stuff serves. So as we move through this with new technology coming in, you know, already biometric has been adopted by some airlines. It will be increasingly something that we'll be using to get people faster and faster through airports. And whether it's new digital immigration channels, so this is one that's been looked at in, in Dubai. And I think this is what you'll see come forward. So yesterday I was excited to see yet again Australia and New Zealand talking about being able to fly seamlessly. And it will be technology that allows that to happen. And that will again change the amount of space, the speed that we can move people through airports, etc. So those I think will be the other huge challenges that we are going to see that will bring that through. And whether it's apps, and what was interesting living in Asia was to see how that challenge and, and the change happened even a couple of years ago. So what I was quite fascinated here to see was this question about how mobile apps are transforming things. And when I was living in Malaysia, what was interesting was our biggest low cost carrier there is called AirAsia. AirAsia, I don't know if you noticed, changed its name. So the airline is called AirAsia, but the company is now called capital A. Why is it called capital A? Because that's the big A for their app. So they've renamed the company after the app. Okay. So the app is now what the company is named after. And you can see what's happening here is it's the ability to link all the different services together. Flights, hotel, accommodation, food delivery, airport pickup, whatever it is. So this is now we disintermediated things before COVID. In fact, that was what digital was able to do. And now we're reintermediated by pulling it all together through these apps. 
And you can begin to see that happen here in Australia as well. The only way you can book a bonzer flight is if you get the bonds app. I don't even have a website that you can book through. I can't have one there. Well, hardly a couple of airlines, but anyway, yeah. So, so we can begin to see that these super apps and partnerships will also transform how people book and use tourism. And I think that again is going to be challenging for tourism as the jobs shift. So a lot of jobs that were people focused are now more digitally focused. And so you can see now when I said to the guy at TUI, I said, why are you concerned about your staff only coming in two days a week? He said, Perry, most of the people who work in the building are IT people. So they don't work for me. They're going to go work for IBM, they work for Oracle. He said, that's who I'm competing with. So the nature and the type of people in the industry has also changed. And this brings us with an interesting challenge about what skills do we want people to have in education? Because do we want people that were people people? So most tourism hospitality programs, we were focused on the people, the people skills. Then we want everyone to be a finance and MBA person, because that finance, hey, we can get the apps and AI to do that. So are we going more to the technology or will we swing back to the people skills? Or how do we marry technology and people skills together? Because that I think will be the challenge. And as work goes forward, I remember having factories in the northern part of the UK when I was growing up, they're all gone. The office is just about gone. <laughs> hotel chains, this is an Indian hotel chain, allow people to work from anywhere. Before that was inconceivable. You have to come to work, you have to be there. So as companies change their thinking, and as people don't go to work anymore, what the impact of that has been. So San Francisco, you can see this is mobile phones going into city centers. If you look at the bottom there, San Francisco. And so what this is telling you is only 31% of the mobile phones are being connected in San Francisco that there were before COVID, which means people are no longer going into the city center. So the other day I read that the Westfield shopping mall in San Francisco was closing because there's no foot traffic. Two hotels in San Francisco have gone bankrupt, pulled out. So you're beginning to see a city actually implode, which was one of America's top tourism cities at one point, because the rest of its economy has begun to unfold. So we can see people aren't returning to work. These are newspaper headlines from earlier this year, trying again, as I said, Two we wanted two days a week. What we're seeing with other shift is Airbnb bookings have not only boosted up, but what we are seeing is that one in five nights involves weekends. So they're longer, sorry, the one in five nights were stayed of a month or longer. And what you're seeing now increasingly is more and more bookings over weekends. So just to finish off, when you looked at it in the US now, the big talk there, remember about my trends early, was leisure, because you can begin to see how many people are now booking business trips combined with weekend trips, which this little chart begins to show you here. So we can begin to see that this is another trend, and as people travel, work differently, they will travel differently. So we'd all maybe like to be the digital nomad, the professor sitting by the pool in Bali, <laughs> but these are going to be the challenges we see. So to finish up, how do we combine the digital and environment? Because I think that's going to be the pressing question as we go forward. How do we build that? I'm a firm believer that tomorrow will be better, but I'm an optimist. <laughs> There's not many optimists around sometimes, but I do like to be that. And I do think that we can build that. And so my colleagues, you know, where I work in the Netherlands, as I mentioned, my colleague, Paul Peters, uh, Paul is very involved in this. Uh, and he's done a lot of work on these questions of decarbonizing aviation. We have three research areas. One is on tourism, uh, tourism research in, in terms of carbon aviation. And the other one we're focusing on very much is on impacts. So we have what we call conscious tourism destinations. And so again, we're working with different destinations in the Netherlands about how to balance and manage tourism rather than just grow tourism to bring in community and people together. So hopefully that will bring it in just within time. <laughs> Sorry, I forgot over. 
But the, the thoughts of some of the challenges that I see them uh, un unfolding. And remember, no trends exist in singularity. The challenge here is how different trends combine. And that I think is going to be the unusual and challenging thing as we see going forward. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you.